Welcome to Cavalry A through Z, the tutorial series where I go through most of the behaviors and deformers of cavalry in alphabetical order. Thanks for joining me and let's get learning. For this first one, we have the letter A, so we are going to cover the accumulator, the align, and animation control behaviors. And while I did use other behaviors, those three are the main ones for this animation. So first I'll do a breakdown of each individual behavior and kind of how they work, and then I'll show you how I put them all together. So the basis of this animation comes from the align deformer. So right now I have this align deformer connected to this rectangle shape. And basically what it does is it allows us to move where the origin point is within the shape itself. This is similar to moving the pivot point in the attributes, but a little bit more controlled and constrained. So we can see here the values just go from positive one to negative one, and it moves the pivot point within the body itself, all the way up or all the way down. Same thing with left and right. And to kind of illustrate what it's doing, if we turn on this frame rotation and we get that started, you can see that it's rotating around the pivot point, which as we move, it can kind of change the shape of what the rotation looks like. So by just changing the values in this align deformer, we can actually have kind of a lot of control over the animation. So if we come back to our main composition and zoom in on just one of the rectangle elements, which it looks like a circle because it's so small and it has rounded corners, but technically it is a rectangle shape. So if I turn off the align deformer, we can see that the origin point is right here in the center of the shape. When I turn it back on, we'll see it's moved to this top right corner. And here I added some keyframes. Let's just zoom in here. So we can see if we look at the align deformer is that I animated it keyframe after keyframe from negative one, negative one to positive one, negative one then positive one, positive one, and negative one, positive one, and then back to negative one, negative one. And so as we scroll through these, you'll see that it's just kind of moving around in this kind of square pattern. And that is what the align is doing. Other things that I've done to this rectangle shape is just add a random node that is connected to the width and the height. So that each one as it's duplicated will have a different overall size. Next, let's take a look at the animation control. So in this example, I have these eyes and they follow a target and I can also make them blink. So if we open up this component and I, I am using the betas. And so if you don't have a beta, some of these things you won't have access to just yet. But for this video, you have access to all of the things that I'm using. So we have two keyframes on each of the eye bases, which just they have two positions. One is fully open and the other is fully closed. So basically what it's doing is when it's connected to these keyframes, it will interpolate from keyframe one to keyframe two from 0% to 100%. And so it'll automatically add the inside, uh, the inner values. And so as we slide this, it can blink and it can go as slow or as fast as we want to animate it. And so one way to use the animation control is if you have a very complex animation, you can connect it to all of the individual keyframes and then animate it and retime it if it's slower or faster. The other thing that you can do is here I have my blink animation and instead of animating the eye shape every time I want it to blink, I can just connect it to here and then animate the animation control anytime I want it to blink. So you could basically have access to the movements or animations at any point in the timeline without having to copy and paste a bunch of things over. Another thing that's cool about this is that you can use other behaviors to automate some of this stuff. So what we can do here is if we right click on the amount, add behavior and add, and we're gonna add an oscillator. So here we can see if we play it, it now, well, let's put some proper values in. So we want it to go from zero to 100. And so now if we play it, we see that the eyes are slowly opening and closing. Now this doesn't look great as a blink in my opinion. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna change this to actually be minus 100. And so what that's gonna do is that it's going to stay on the zero value of the animation control for longer than the the blinking animation values. So now if we watch it, it'll blink and then stay open and then blink. So it stays open for a little bit longer. And if you want it to be open even longer, just make that minus 200. And so now when we look at it, it blinks and then it's open for much longer. If you want the whole thing to be faster so that the blink is faster, 
you can play around with the time scale. So we make this twice as fast, then it blinks twice as fast, but it also stays open for half as long. So then what we would wanna do is put this to maybe like minus 400. And so now it has a faster blink and it still stays open for as long as we want it to. And move this around. So with this oscillator, it's basically just oscillating between on and off. But instead, what you can do is if we delete that and then on this amount, we can place a noise. So here, let's make the noise again from, we'll just do zero to 100. And so now, as it's going, it's kind of just randomly moving back and forth between these two keyframe poses that we have. So if we go back into our main animation and zoom in on the single one, we see that we have these four uh, frames that we've defined in the align. And so then in our animation control, if we turn this back on, what I have is a noise. And so if we look at it, it's gonna be moving back and forth kind of erratically, but within these defined keyframes. And because the noise will be different for each index, when we turn on the duplicator, now we have a bunch of these things and they're different sizes because we have the random on the size in the rectangle shape. And then they're all moving differently because of the noise in the animation control. So next, let's talk about how we use the accumulator to make this actual shape. So here's an example where we have an accumulator and these rectangles are changing size and width and everything, but they're always put right up next to each other. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna just recreate this so you can see the step-by-step. Step. So we start out, we'll pull in a rectangle, we'll get rid of the fill, put on a stroke. And so what you can do is if you have a palette loaded, you can hit the hamburger sign and then do create array from palette. And I'm gonna just remove this last color because it is the same color as the background. So now we'll plug this color array into the outline stroke color. And then we'll just make this a little bit bigger Go back to the shape, I'm gonna just add a little bit of a roundness to it. And then on the width and the height, what we can do is I'm going to add a noise to this one. And for the noise, let's go for something like 25 to 100. Okay, and just kind of see how that's moving around. That looks a bit small, so why don't we uh, keep that at 25, but we'll just do like 250. Great, so now we have a lot more motion. And what we can do is we can just change the time scale to two, so it's just a little bit faster. So we can kind of see the effect a little bit better. And I'll turn on looping. For some reason, looping makes it way too fast. So let's actually go ahead and put that back down to one. All right, so now we have our looping randomness. We just put the color array in here. So what we'll do is we'll alt click on the duplicator. So now we have our duplicate. And we wanna put this into point instead of grid. And so now, the more that we add, they all just kind of stack on top of each other. So this is where we're gonna use the accumulator. Control period or command period to pull up our quick add and do accumulator. So in here, we're gonna take the value of what needs to be accumulated and then apply it to something else. So the value that we need to get is the rectangle's width if we're going horizontal. If you're going vertical, then you'd wanna use height. So we pull in the width into the value, and then in the duplicator, so we want this accumulated value to be put into the shape position's x value. So we put that here. You see that they all start to kind of do what they're supposed to, but it's a little bit off. I'm gonna pull the duplicator over here just so we can see it a little bit better. So now it's not actually doing what it's supposed to be doing. So what we can do here is if we pull up the noise, right click on this top bar, go to context and then do filter position, but it's still a little bit off. And this is one of those things where I'm not 100% sure why, but I do know how to fix it. So all we need to do is in our rectangle shape, we're gonna go ahead and add an align deformer. And then we're gonna push the X all the way to one, which makes the pivot be all the way to the left of the object. So now the accumulator is getting the width of the shape and then saying the next one is going to start right there. And so the origin of this white one is all the way to the left. So it starts right where this one ends. Same thing with the yellow. The origin is here, so it starts right where the, the white one ends. And if we play it, we see that as 
the noise is changing things, it's updating the values correctly, so now everything is kind of touching. And the last thing is that it's taking the shape's sort of like base width, which doesn't factor in the stroke amount. So if we go into our rectangle and go into stroke, we can change this and it'll just keep overlapping and nothing really happens. All we need to do to fix that is go to the accumulator and it has a padding value. And so what we can do is you can either change it manually if you want, which can be nice if you want these like gaps, right? So now these gaps will always kind of stay the same. But if you want it based on the stroke width, then what you can do is go to the stroke, grab the width, and we'll just pull it down into the accumulator padding. Doing it this way will allow you to just change the stroke width and it'll always work. And if you wanted to add a little gap here as well, what you could do is on the padding, right click, add expression, and we'll just say plus 10. So now they all have a distance of 10, regardless of how thick or thin the lines are, but it's still relatively the same. And so that's the basics behind how the accumulator works. So in this main animation, we can see that I've used the same basic principles, but I've kind of added extra stuff to it to make it a little bit more interesting. So what I've done here is in the rectangle shape height, we can see that I've put that into the accumulator, into the accumulator value. So if we take a look at the accumulator and press this little button, we can kind of see what all is connected in. So we have a random size that's on the height going into the rectangle height. That goes into the accumulator, which then goes into a math node. So if we look at this math node, what I've done is the first is the accumulator. So this is just getting the actual heights of each shape. Then I'm adding from an oscillator. So this oscillator here is going from minus 75 to positive 75 onto the heights. And then I also have a stagger. And so that is kind of what's making the whole thing kind of expand and contract instead of just being still. If we turn off the oscillator, we see that it's kind of just a straight line. And then on the oscillator, I've animated the strength so that it starts out at less strength, so it's like a shorter oscillation, and then it goes to a longer oscillation and then back down. And putting the stagger on it makes it so that each dot will sort of add the oscillation at a slightly, at a slight delay. So that instead of just expanding and contracting uniformly, it's more of this kind of up and down kind of floating motion. So to recap, we have the main shape, its motion is actually just the, the align being animated. That align is being controlled by the animation control with a noise amount so that each one kind of moves in a different way. I've then put that into a duplicator with the accumulator so that each one can be positioned vertically based on its size rather than a set amount. And one other thing that I did here was in the shape position Y, which is the height, whatever value is coming in, I've multiplied by 0.75, which basically means that if the distance is supposed to be 100 pixels, it's actually only giving 75 pixels. And I did that so that there would be a little bit of overlap. And that's how I get sort of these interesting colors because the rectangle shape is also set to plus blend mode. And then once I got to this point, I kind of realized it sort of looked like that dino DNA guy from Jurassic Park. So I went ahead and made some eyes and that's everything to build this animation. Make sure to join me next week when I talk about the behavior mixer, the bevel, blend submesh position, and the Boolean deformers.